A little less bleak than Thailand's political situation. Um, Asia and the Pacific is the second most visited region in the world after Europe. Between 2005 and 2016, Asia outperformed all world regions in terms of growth with arrivals increasing an average of 7% a year compared to a world average of 4%, nearly double. By sub-region, uh, Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia all enjoyed 9% growth in 2016. So we're in an extremely high growth region for hospitality. Uh, the topic of this panel is investing in the region, opportunities and challenges. Uh, we have a distinguished panel today, and uh, maybe I'd like to open up uh, and perhaps ask uh, everyone uh, uh, what, what they look for investment in the region, and if you can disclose what kind of IRR hurdles uh, are you looking to deliver to your stakeholders. So uh, perhaps we can start with Tim. Thank you very much. Um, well, we have, I don't know if anybody knows who we are, we're Red Planet Hotels, we're a budget hotel uh, owner operator in four countries in Southeast Asia. We have Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. Um, we look for different things in obviously different markets, different returns. Um, in Japan, we underwrite at around about, we do a return on capital employed rather than IRR. Um, we find it's a better matrix because it, it, it looks at a project sort of naked, so you can't hide anything clever in the financing and, and, and bankrupt it, and all of that sort of thing. So we, we look for a 10% return annually capital employed in Japan. Um, we, in other markets, we look at probably around about 15%. We've got a few uh, standout projects that annually return on capital employed at 22%, 23%. Um, so we, we look at it on that basis, but you know we're, we're owners and operators, so um, we're sort of asset heavy and happy to have that, that flow through. I think for us, the ownership model is important because on the budget hotel level, that's where the money comes through, you know, one or two million dollars of EBITDA um, per hotel, whereas if we were to, to franchise, you're probably looking at about only thirty, forty thousand dollars of fees per hotel. So certainly in our evolution at the moment, we, we're asset heavy and we're anywhere between 10 in Japan and 20% return on capital employed. So the motivation for you to invest in the region is not only obviously to, uh, to look at the returns on, uh, on the real estate, although that's important, but of course for you to actually get your brand out there and get your brand growing. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And we, we did the four countries who thought that was good, good diversification. I mean, we, we opened our first hotel six years ago so we've, we've grown from 6 to 30 in a relatively short space of time, so we wanted to do that diverse. And, you know, Asia is the fastest growing tourism market in the world, and Japan is incredibly attractive as well. Sure. You know, they had 5 million tourists five years ago, and it was 30 last year, and the last four months it's grown by 15% over last year. So you would do more in Japan? Absolutely. Japan is a big focus of us. Yeah. Um, also, we, we're developing a few more hotels in Manila, um, the Philippines for us has been a hugely successful. Um, it was a perfect storm. It's an undersupply of, of quality budget hotel accommodation there, and we, we took that market. We're now the largest, with the largest budget hotel operator in the Philippines. Good. Well, good to know you're doing well, and uh, good to know that there's a lot of focus on markets that you think are very good, Japan and Philippines. Yeah. Um, let me ask uh, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, uh, what kind of investment approach do you take and what kind of investments are you looking for? And perhaps you want to give a bit of background of, of what you, you do. Oh, sure. Um, no, I'm part of an investing business at Goldman Sachs. It's called the Special Situations Group. It sounds very exotic, but in fact, it's a very simple and um, a bo boring business. We, we provide uh, capital to companies that need it for growth. Um, it could be to develop a piece of real estate, it could be to make an acquisition, uh, it could be for, for CapEx. Um, it, uh, the capital comes in the form of debt or equity, depending on um, the counterparty's preference. Typically, we put it out for you know, three to five years, which is a typical time horizon to, to construct an asset or reposition an asset, um, or for a company to transition to a lower cost of capital. Um, I think it really, uh, the return thresholds depend on where we sit in the capital structure. So if we're doing a intermediate or mezzanine type 
um, debt financing, it might be 10 to 14 percent. Um, if we're doing an equity deal, it's probably 14 percent or higher. Um, and we invest in a lot of different countries around Asia, Japan, China, um, India, Southeast Asia, Korea. So obviously, India and Southeast Asia, we tend to aim for higher returns. Um, and a place like Korea, I think, is a lower cost of capital. Um, so it, it depends a bit based on deal and based on deal structure and country. So it seems that uh, you see opportunities across the region. Uh, it sounds opportunistic in nature, um, but is there any way you wouldn't invest uh, or you wouldn't put your money uh, to work? Well, we, um, I think we tend to invest less in the frontier markets. We did one um, debt financing in Myanmar, which was a telecom tower business, not, a, not real estate. Um, but that's, that was a more opportunistic um, of nature. I think in certain other sectors like real estate, we tend to be more like, focused and tactical. So we'll look for, we'll look for the intersection of a, of a good macro theme and a, and a micro theme. And an example of a great macro theme, which everyone in this room knows, is the um, intra-Asia tourism um, largely the China outbound theme. And if you go through all the statistics, you, you know, you'll see Thailand went from 15 to 30 million. Japan went from five to on its way to 40 million. I think if you look at Cambodia and Laos, it's doubled in the past few years to 10 million across both. I think Vietnam also seeing tremendous growth. Um, even a country like the Philippines with incredible hospitality potential and some of the nicest uh, beaches and ocean only has 6 million visitors which is, to me is a shockingly low, low number when you look across all the countries. Um, so I think the macro theme is pretty obvious. I think any, anyone can come up with the idea. The difficult part is connecting with the micro theme, which is about you know, who's your partner, what's the, the piece of land, the location, the, what, who's your customer, and do you know your customer, and exactly what the customer wants in terms of price point, in terms of experience. Um, and I think if you can connect those two, you really have a, you can have a really good investment investment opportunity, and that's kind of what we like, what we look to do around the region. Sure. And are there markets where you particularly <clears throat> want more exposure to, but you can get exposure into because perhaps there is a lot of capital in certain markets? Yeah, I think in general, Southeast Asia is an area we'd love to have more exposure, but it is an area where that tends to have um, strong domestic capital providers. Um, I think Thailand is an example where domestic banks. Um, you know, are pretty flush with deposits, where the local bond market tends to be pretty liquid, makes it a bit harder to deploy capital, means we have to look a bit harder. Um, I think Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, um, Thailand, we'd all, we, we'd love to deploy more capital. What, why? What is it about Thailand that, yeah. you know, makes you want to deploy more well, capital amidst yeah. the backdrop of... Uh, of political unrest and uh, or, or protect, perhaps mm. political stability now, depends from which perspective you're looking well, at. Well, I think one of the great things to me about um, capitalism and markets is that it works in most government scenarios absent, you know, outright, um, you know, dictatorship like North Korea, for example. Um, so I think Thailand continues to move ahead. Uh, I think Bangkok is one of the most visited cities internationally, probably 20, 25 million visitors a year. Incredible, incredible demand for all types of um, experiences. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's just a great theme that we'd love to capitalize on more. Sure, sure. And uh, what about yourself uh, with uh, Gore Capital, uh, Jan Kirsten? Uh, yeah. What kind of markets are you looking at? Of course, a big investor in hotels across the region. Yeah. Go Capital uh, Hospitality that I represent. Um, the mother company is Go Capital out of Hong Kong, a private equity firm. Um, and we have since two years one dedicated hospitality fund uh, where we only go hotels. And we actually um, have one in Europe today as well. I met one colleague in the room here yesterday, or met, I saw him at the airport in uh, Hanoi. It was not by coincidence, <laughs> but uh, I think personally, uh, Vietnam is a very interesting market, being uh, Ho Chi Minh or Hanoi. Um, we have uh, Go Capital, we have our own hotels that we operate. Most probably you're familiar with the G brand. We have Pullman G, we have friends from our core here today. 
Chase. Uh, we have Pullman G in, in Pattaya, we have G in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and so forth. So that's a brand we want to expand on that we operate ourselves. Then we have uh, asset management when we have third parties. The most famous one that I think everyone in the room is familiar with is the Intercont in Hong Kong. It was close to a billion dollar uh, acquisition a few years ago. We have uh, Hyatt in Da Nang. Uh, we recently acquired uh, Renaissance in Okinawa. But coming back to that, I think uh, Vietnam is very interesting. Uh, da Nang has a few more good years to go. I wouldn't say 10, but a few more years to go. Nha Trang uh, could be as well, even though it's a mega development there. Do they have the infrastructure to, to cope with it? I really don't know. But talking challenges, and I, I know I'm going to sidetrack here a bit because I'm more from the <coughs> asset management side. Uh, and I think what's quite interesting is Da Nang. If you look at the feeder markets, Korea, today to give you statistics, is about 250 direct international flights per week into Da Nang of which more than 150 from Korea. Now, in any business, putting all eggs in one basket. I've seen statistics from hotel in Da Nang that has 83% Korean business. Now, here we have a challenge, gentlemen. And I can tell you, we, put, we are pushing the height guys like no tomorrow to diversify their business. Uh, so, you said Vietnam is a good market, but you've also said that it's a, a place like Da Nang is uh, heavy on one nationality you mix. You have to be careful the way you do business, as simple as that. So would you recommend then investing in Da Nang now? I would. You Today, still would? I still would, but you have to be very careful in your segmentation and how you perform your business. Okay. Now, let, let's you know, go back and pick up the theme on Thailand's a good investment. Uh, so. Uh, Jonathan, Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam's always, obviously done very well over the years, uh, in recent years. Uh, and Thailand, of course, is, is, a, is, a, is a steady producer of good mm -hmm. demand within the hospitality space. Uh, would you pick one or the other, or are you looking at both markets as well right now? Uh, we're, we're definitely looking at both. I mean, to, to me, Thailand is it's a much more mature, more developed economy. Vietnam is, um, is only recently started to, um, to really develop in rapid form, largely with a lot of Korean investment. Um, I think Thailand, to me, is the leader in hospitality in Southeast Asia. It's got the biggest number of visitors. It's really, um, I think, setting the standard in terms of um, hospitality. It's got multiple destinations from the beach resorts to Bangkok to Chiang Mai. It's, it's, um, I think it offers a really diverse experience with uh, repeat, repeat business. I think Vietnam, um, I think has a lot of potential. It's a long coastline, um, lots of different beaches you can visit, different cities, interesting cultural, um, uh, very diverse geography in terms of mountains and beaches. Um, but I think it is still at the very beginning of its, of its development and probably at risk of uh, oversupply, perhaps more than Thailand would be. Okay, and that risk of oversupply <coughs> is basically because Vietnam's not building more infrastructure for more airlines to land, more, more flights to come in, because Thailand, we just keep expanding well, think, our airports. I think Vietnam, right? wherever you go in Vietnam today, it's like an epic construction boom taking place <laughs> across all sectors of real estate, hotels, office, residential. So I just think it's a little more, um, you know, build it and they will come type mentality. Where I think Thailand's been through a few cycles and people understand, you know, this is a a cyclical business, there's a supply and demand that has to be matched. Sure. And I think Thanks. also, well, sure. Yeah, I was just thinking Bangkok. Uh, the challenge is to, to find an asset to buy, as simple as that. I mean, I saw uh, Dilip, uh, the CEO of, of mine, was here recently. If he would put this hotel on the market, we will all stand in line. But it's, it's, yeah. uh, you can just not find anything. And the little business that is made in, in uh, Bangkok is usually under the radar. A few yeah. ones, but you have Phuket is a good example. Yes. Uh, it's going like this. It's coming back. 
the whole west coast of Phuket is already developed. Yes. And now we're starting to see the east coast coming. Correct. And, and if they just can keep up or go one a little bit faster in the pace of infrastructure, uh, you're going to see Phuket uh, another 50 hotels on the east coast. So definitely your fund is looking to buy hotels in Bangkok if you can find one. Definitely. Okay. All right. My business is to build and sell hotels. So. Okay, but let's talk later. So in about two years, I'll have one in Bangkok. <laughs> we, we can have a chat then. Um, let's talk about uh, uh, the, the economy segment. Uh, and, then, uh, and I just want to run, run on this theme a little bit and move into the segments and opportunities in countries and segments to go in. Obviously, you stay in one segment. Yeah. Is there any market you wouldn't go into? Or is there a market that you're not in that you really want to get into in your segment? I mean, we... The, the budget hotels work best in big cities. Um, the resort properties struggle, we sure. found, um, because you know our room is a, is a 14, 15 square meter room. Um, so if you go on holiday in one of our hotels, it's a bit of an endurance test. So it, it, we're, about a, you know, we're about a one and a half, two, two, two day stay maximum. Um, so it's, it's busy, and we, we like the big cities. Um, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't open up in Dana, right? No. No, definitely not. No. No, I, and I, I'm with John on that. I, I worry about what's going to happen there if everybody's going to build too many hotels and it's all going to go pear-shaped for, for a long cycle. Um, we like, we, we need to sniff around Australia. We like that. But, but really our strategic goal now is do, doing more of what works well, right? How surprising is that? But budget some companies hotels. don't do it. So with budget hotels in big cities, we're doing infill in Manila. Soon we'll have about uh, 10 hotels in Manila itself uh, and rolling out throughout Japan. Uh, the other thing, the other challenge we have in some of these countries is debt. Getting debt can be quite a challenging process, particularly in Thailand. So I probably won't be doing many more hotels here. I mean, the ones we have, we've got five hotels that did work well. But getting these things financed from the banks here is a nightmare. And, and the level of debt that they'll give you is tiny, so it's 35 40% maximum. Whereas in Japan, we're funding up to 75% uh, debt, and that's at 1.8%, you know, 1.9%. 1 .1 and the amortization rate is 100 years. <laughs> so, so the returns there for it's a relatively massive. stable, for a stable economy is extremely attractive. So, and it, it, it's really hot right now. And, and the, the so your cash yields and your equity going into Japan, uh, given you're borrowing at one and you're probably buying or at six, seven, eight, nine, I'm not sure. Well, what are you looking at? What are you actually looking at the yield and the cash? Uh, so you, uh, return to equity is around about 30% on some of our projects. That's phenomenal. Uh, for a place like That's Japan. That's phenomenal. It, it's, I mean, for, it's a, great. for a stable economy, that is a... It's great. And the place is on fire. And there's a... If you look back at the hotel business in Japan, it's been, it's been running along around about 85% for the last 35 years, or not 25 years, um, and then suddenly boomed, and the supply is not caught up. So there's a lot of Airbnb going on in Japan. And what we're seeing is every time a hotel opens up, the people are coming from Airbnb into the hotel. So they're basically filling as fast as we can. I mean, there wouldn't be... 30 million tourists arriving last year because the hotel stock couldn't accommodate it. Um, but we're seeing everybody just piling. So that the, the level of frustrated demand in Japan is enormous. And it doesn't matter where you look. It doesn't matter what city you look at. It's just bottom left, top right hotel that, demand. That's, that's a phenomenal insight. I've never, in the 30 years that I've been building and doing hotels, I have never seen a country like it in my entire career. It is absolutely incredible. And I don't mind saying that here because it's really tough to get in there. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Okay. So let's talk about challenges then, right? And getting into certain markets. Um, let's start with Japan. Uh, and let maybe uh, f uh, for those who have looked at Japan, uh, what are the challenges of getting into the, uh, to the Japanese market? Well, we just, we just got out of it. <laughs> <laughs> we did uh, most probably the best deal in, in, in the at least in, amongst the hotels in Gold Capital, when we sold uh, Hyatt in Osaka. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also a, a quite interesting part, and, and that's when you're an asset manager, that your relation with the operator. 
I mean, and I can say that because it was before I joined, um, where we actually turned that hotel, had had red figures for 20 years. After six months, it was turned. It was the first time, I think, Go Capital got the phone call from head office of Hyatt and said, what the hell is going on? And we just went in, cleaned up the place, closed outlets that were running red and so on and so forth, sold it three years later and had done the best deal in the short history of, of, of the uh, hotel assets of Go Capital. So we got out of it uh, in a very nice way and, uh, but we do, a few trips has been going to Japan as well and to try to find some new uh, possibilities. It's quite a closed market because it's going to be isolationist for quite a while and, and so if we, when we first started going to Japan, we just, we just took a look at the, at the market there and that was when it was still a bit sleepy and we looked at the hotel stock there and it was a business hotel is what they call them, the budget hotels there. And the, the hotel stock's quite poor, right? They've not, been, they've not been served well. So we decided to, to go in there and penetrate the market because it was just a stable 85%. I thought, oh, well, we, you know, if we open up one of our hotels, it's all new and sexy and fun, people will flock. So we thought, this is a great idea. Then, of course, the tourism picked up. But when we were going around looking for our first deal, it was like, hi, we know we're Red Planet Hotels, we're a Cayman company, we, we're going to... Who? Cayman? What? No, no, who are you? Because the Japanese are, and it's an interesting culture because they want to sell to somebody who they know or who has a reputation and, and, and it's all very important. So to get over that, we actually acquired a listed company and then went through there and then that was fine. Because even to think about getting debt as a Cayman-based company was just a non-starter. So we went, we acquired a listed company uh, and then used that as our vehicle in Japan and then it was fine. So you actually had to buy an established company to establish your Correct. position in that market Correct. in order to get into that market. Exactly. That was not, that's not a very easy thing to do. No. Definitely no. not. It was. Oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, uh, Japan, uh, yeah. what's deal flow like yeah, there? I agree with uh, everything Tim has, has said. Um, you know, it's, you really need to have a local team. So we have 10 um, people in our Tokyo office, all Japanese you know, focused on our investing business in Japan. And it's really, a, it's a locals game and local contacts. Um, if they know you, they'll lend money to you. If they don't, they won't. Um, so it's just, it's a difficult market and you have to be local. So we have a few hotel investments there and still pretty positive on the market outlook. Okay, so. Including we own two uh, hotels that we've leased to uh, Red Planet. Oh, okay. Okay. Back with okay. guys, so. Good deal between you? Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, we think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. You're happy as well? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, now, I'm, now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, Japan, challenge, you've got to be local. You've got to be part of the business ecosystem uh, there. Uh, Thailand, access to debt seems to be a challenge. And that's, that's kind of everywhere in the emerging markets. The Philippines is tricky too. I mean, the banks are, I don't know whether they struggle to attract the best talent, but it, it's really difficult and so, so slow. You know, development loans, and I mean, we've had, we've started construction on hotels, and we've and we've started, we have signed the term sheet as we've started construction, and we've opened the hotel, and we're still banging on with the banks. And it's just daft. I mean, I, I think. So, Jonathan, really are you are you supplying then some debt here? Yeah, uh, we made an investment in Red Planet. Okay. Um, 2014. No. 15. 16. 16. Yeah. Okay. It's not been that long. Okay. It seems like it. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great investment so far, and um, Tim and his team are great, great operators. Great. So, challenges in other markets. What's the biggest challenge in any, other, in any market you're currently working in? And I know you've mentioned some, uh, so perhaps I can open it up to, to the rest of the floor here and, and ask what you think, Jan. Well, I know there might be some Australians in here, but we entered into Perth, and then you realize that if you are used to hard work, you suddenly are dealing with people working nine to five and then they're waxing their surfboards, you know? So, no, I'm serious about it. It's, it's a challenge to work with Australia because they are not used to the pace of work. And I'm not saying it's wrong, eh? 
I love free time and play golf and surf and whatever, but it is a challenge with Australia, end of story. Um, but Australia, I would like to touch on something else because you mentioned segmentation. And uh, our hospitality fund, the first investment that was done was the G Hotel in Singapore, it used to be called the Big Hotel on, on Middle Road. Mm. Uh, and the second, and here we go about segmentation, and I don't like the expression, but, and it's a cliche maybe to think outside the box. And we're talking about the hospitality fund and we bought a, a office building. And on, in December we will open the first uh, student accommodation downtown Perth. So from an office building to student accommodation and hostel. Uh, was that the challenge in itself? Or was it the people? Was it, it the itself, people? Yes, you have to uh, convince quite a few people that this is the right thing to do. Uh, the challenge is, I think, uh, finances is not that big of a problem, actually, in Australia. Um, but work speed is. And, uh, but I also wanted to touch on, on, on the, the subject of segmentation that you mentioned, that, that you actually you don't have to buy ready beds. You can actually produce something outside uh, the box and make it successful. Well, we touched on segmentation, and suddenly we understand from Tim where he wants to put his hotels and where budget hotels that he does works. Let's talk about generally luxury, mid-market economy or budget. Um, you know, generally across the countries in this region, um, would all these products work, uh, or is it just a simple rule that you know a city hotel can do budget, can do four star, and can do high end, or is there something you would not do in a particular market uh, in terms of segment of hotel or hospitality product? Wow, you caught me there. Uh... I always say that the, the, the top always going to work, you know. Regardless, always going to work. Regardless where you are. And in this, in this part of the world, you go to Hong Kong, you go to Singapore, you go to Bangkok, the top hotels work. I mean, the top hotels in Bangkok probably get... However... 350 US, 450, so if, if, if you're lucky, right? I mean, I think Park Heights and a new benchmark. Uh, and definitely raise the Comsec uh, to, to, uh, and made a lot of people happy when that happened. Uh, but would you actually go and build a luxury hotel in Bangkok and, you know, say you can get a $800 a night, $600 a night US uh, versus somewhere like Phuket and certain beaches on the uh, West Coast where you say, well, why isn't there Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton there? Because you'd probably be able to get $600 to $800 US dollars there. So well, uh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Rosewood is there. Okay. Uh, right. So so so, but, but I'm so that segment will work in Phuket. The the real high. You're gonna get that six hundred dollar rate a night. That seven hundred dollar rate a night. It can happen. Yeah. Look at uh, Amman. Yeah. But Bangkok. I'm not as convinced. The the rates are very low, relatively speaking, in Bangkok. Uh, if my I would most probably go to a three, four star yeah. in yeah. Bangkok. And that's the thing. If you look at the spread between the three, four star and the extreme high end uh, hotels, mm. it's very low in Bangkok. In fact, uh, for mid-market hotels, Bangkok generally gets quite a good rate uh, because there's so much demand. But on the high end side, they're not able to actually push the rate up. Mm. Uh, so, yep, segment, I think, is uh, uh, an aspect that has to be looked into in different markets. Jonathan, do you have, do you have a view of this? Yeah, I have a, a, a few thoughts I can, can add. Um, I mean, I look at where, where in Asia, if you look at China outbound and other intra-Asia, where is the biggest um, demographic segment of demand? And that's really in the, the mass market or even like a, a premium mass. And when you look at some of the statistics and demographics in China, there's some reports out there that estimate the, the cohort is about 68 million today people, which is like the size of France. I mean, these are like really big numbers. Um, and that segment of people earn, on average, about 32000 U.S. per year reported um, and spend about 8000 a year on travel. 
and that's um, largely a millennial segment, and they spend a higher percentage on travel than um, older generations. And I think that's a really powerful force. And this segment is going to grow to the size of like 120 million in the next like five or seven years, which is the size of Mexico. Again, like another mind-bogglingly big, big number. Um, and so I think if you can find uh, a product or an experience or a location that caters to this segment, just the sheer volume of numbers should keep your, your product filled up. Um, so to me, I like going where the biggest sec segment of demand lies. Okay, and obviously the numbers that you just stated uh, are Chinese travelers. Chinese, yeah. uh, Now, What they call Chinese mass. mass Chinese premium. mass, which yeah. is equivalent to size of countries. Yes. Uh, yeah. Which is a staggering number. Um, <clears throat> are we becoming too dependent on the Chinese traveler? I mean, uh, are they repeat travelers? Uh, and will they, uh, are we becoming too dependent? Is this something that we are building hotels to, to meet a, a temporary demand, or do you think this trend will just continue and you know, the need to travel will, 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 will continue? It just started. Yeah. Sorry? It just started. Yeah. It just Only started. What, five, six percent of So unlike, unlike the Koreans in <coughs> Da Nang, the Chinese everywhere coming to this region has just started. Just started. Yeah. But we shouldn't, yes, you talk about the mess, but you also have a little segment on top. Eh? Sure. Shouldn't forget. Yeah. I mean, I just spent a few days, I had a look at the uh, banyan tree in, in Phuket. It was, I cannot I don't know the percentage, but, and it, it, you know, you don't stay for free there. Um, <laughs> so, the problem is for the operator here, is that the Western Europeans are snobs and starting to question the management, how come you have Chinese in the, in the hotel? You know, we, it's, it's like Chinese. we love their money, but not their faces. <laughs> so, you know, make up your mind. I'm sorry, this is, is the fact of life. But what I'm trying to say is they're not only going to fill the, the two, three, four star in the hostels, they, they, there is a segment up there as well. So we see what Mr. Vlad at uh, Amanpour is going to say. Yeah, I mean, definitely the market has changed significantly. Yes. I mean, significantly. The, the Chinese. The Chinese traveler in Red Planet Hotels is the highest rate segment for us. I think they pay the highest. It used to be a few years ago, oh, well, that's the cheap, the cheap guys coming from China. Now it's they're our, our, our top rated segment. I mean, there is aspirational demand from the Chinese, right? And uh, if you look at a market like Chiang Mai, we were just discussing before, a lot of the upscale boutiques, smaller hotels, get a remarkable rate up there, three, four hundred US. And, predominantly coming from the, from the Chinese market. So, uh, so definitely not a temporary thing. It's going to happen. Uh, what about the next big market, India? Uh, you know, and is anybody tracking that? And, same, you know, same. Same, same, right? Yeah. But sure. we don't see the same rapid growth of something like 15% CAGR for a few years. No, but I mean, China went basically from zero to this. Yeah. It's been India so has quick. been up here somewhere, and, and it's still... Uh, picking up. Eh? It's been so quick, and suddenly we realized, oh my goodness, all our hotels are full of Chinese. What happened? It was sort of almost from one year to the next. So suddenly now the website's in Chinese, our app's in Chinese, all of that sort of good stuff. So was, we've had to really adapt quickly. But again, coming back to that one segment issue, in Okinawa, we had about 80% of our market was, was Chinese. So we've now deliberately switched and we've not sold to a, 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 a bunch of tour operators and we've, we're selling back into Thailand and Philippines just to diversify that because I think that's quite a high reliance. So we had that in one of our hotels. Being so reliant on the Chinese and when we're making decisions to invest in certain markets, how much does the tour operators or the power of Chinese tour operators play into segments that you invest into and how do you handle that negotiating power that they could have and they have in some markets already and how does one manage that? From my perspective, um, actually the biggest demand generator into our hotels is through C-Trip. Yeah. So we're not negotiating with, with, with tour operators that much. It's, it's, we've got air crew, we've got, we've got some group tours and visa tours and, and that sort of thing, but it's not, it's not huge for us. 
it's, it's a lot of online OTA stuff. Okay. Any comments on that? Mm. No, and it's, the OTAs are running our business. Oh. <laughs> they are indeed. They are indeed. One market you would not invest to in the, in the region, if any. China. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. We, we looked at China, and now, that was three, four years ago, and my goodness, was that interesting. I'll leave it there. But um, now, the great, the great thing is we, we're benefiting from the China story without the risk of investing into China. What's, right? What are the risks? Oh, you, you, well, first of all, they'll run off with your brand. The second is can't get any money out. <laughs> So, I mean, it's just it's pretty basic stuff. Sure. Yeah. Plus, you have oversupply in certain. Oh, and, and in my sector, it's it's horrendous, absolute horrendous. Okay. Yeah. China. And it's hard to compete with the locals in China. So they move quickly, access to lots of capital. Yeah. Myanmar, would you invest? We have no. enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. It's time being said. Yeah. I mean. No, in, but Myanmar is. Do you know what? There could be opportunities for there. I mean, we all know politics, everything is going to change. When? In a year, in five years, in ten years, I don't know. But we'll probably can pick up something very nice in Myanmar today and, and cash in later. Uh, we own the Strand and we have the Strand crews there. And obviously, it's always been like this. And now we're at the bottom and then for, for no reasons. Yeah? But sure, there could be opportunities in, in uh, Myanmar today. India? We have an investment in India in a hotel platform um, called Sami. They have about 25 hotels. Um, we made the investment in 2015. Um, and it's, I mean, we think we got in close to the cyclical low in the industry. Um, it, India is mainly a, the, the segment of the hotels that, w that we own are mainly business hotels in the major cities. Um, and I think business demand is coming back lack of new supply, continued demand, uh, and we're expecting a cyclical upturn. But India is, I think, one of the more difficult countries to invest in. And challenges are similar to China or different challenges? Um, a lot different, I would say different than China. Um, in China, I would say the, the execution happens extremely quickly. Um, and I was speaking to one hotel operator that um, contrasted the India-China experience. They had started a platform in both countries at the same period of time. In, in the time it took to develop 10 hotels in India, the Chinese partner had developed 1,000 hotels. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and so, this is a high fixed cost business where you really need to like, scale your capital quickly. So a lot so, of red tape in India. Yeah, it takes a long time. Okay, we have just about 10 minutes left. Um, can I open up uh, now for questions from the floor, if any? Everybody wants to have drinks, I think. Yeah, exactly. When is it cocktail? None? <laughs> non golden question. Uh, but do you see yourselves investing in the United States as one of the few Americans in the room? No. Yeah, we I'm curious if uh, uh, you folks are yeah. looking to a, a very mature market like the United States. We do. Uh, we have a joint partnership with um, a company called Journal in the States. Actually, Go Capital was initiated when uh, Goodwin Go bought um, in LA the famous, now I even lost the name, it's so famous. Um, give me the old classic, where they had the first. Uh, huh? Rosewood, Roosevelt, Roosevelt Hotel. That's where it started. Uh, today we have uh, hotels in Chicago, New York, uh, LA, and it's are quite active trying to acquire more. So to answer your question, we and our joint partner journal in the States are definitely looking at opportunities. So let's talk about that. Sorry. Um, I'm going to go out on the limb here. I think with the States and the way the hotel market is in the States, every time I go back to the States and stay in a hotel, it gets more and more like flying in one of those awful American airlines. 
and I, I just see that the service quality and uh, just just going downhill gradually, and it's the same with the airlines. And I think that the commoditization of the hotel business in the States is very far advanced. So for us to crack that market, I think would be a really tough ask. So at the moment, no. 16 hotels per 1,000 people in the US. There you go. The number in Vietnam is one. Yeah, there so. you go. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get that. That's an amazing oh, statistic. Six, uh, it's my stat. I looked it up this morning. Um, 16 hotels per 1,000 population. 16 rooms. Oh. The number in Vietnam is one. It's a lot of hotels. Yeah. So you, you touched upon working with partners in markets, and you know, let's talk about <coughs> going into regions. Uh, how much do you all rely on working with partners in certain markets in this region, or is the preference always to go in uh, alone uh, and buy a listed company in Japan and you know uh, build hotels. Um, you know, to to what extent uh, uh, are the, the markets in this region different when it comes to adopting a strategy to go in and invest in these markets from a perspective of working with local partners? Um, I mean, we typically do our own thing. Um, obviously, not Japan, but but you know, we do have various partnerships and and. What we've learned very quickly is one of the most important business decisions you can make is choice of partner. So I think it, it's critical, and that can be the bank, that can be brokers that you buy land from, it can be um, construction companies. So that choice of partner is critical, but we, we tend to generally do it ourselves because it, it's an easy, for us, it's an easy thing to build. We know what we're doing. We have, partnerships with, with architectural companies that will build all of our hotels. So, so in that form, it's an extremely important. But in terms of financial partners or, or, or operators, we don't have that. OK. I would say, for us, uh, partner choice of partner is, is everything. Yeah, I think it's a, a, one of the biggest contributing factors to success in our investing business around Asia. OK. Well, I think it's very different also from market to market. Mm. I mean, you mentioned Japan. That, that you have to have a, a local partner and, and you know someone that is so much built on trust and, and uh, mm. traditions and whatever. Um, I mean, we recently acquired the, the Renaissance in, in Okinawa, mm. and, and one of the first things was to get some local guys that could uh, liaise uh, with the tenant. You know, it, it's so important. I think Japan. Korea, to a certain extent as well, uh, is more important than in other places. I mean, in Singapore or Hong Kong, we can deal it with ourselves. Sure. So it sounds like this region, we're long on investment here. We've got huge growth happening. Um, and it sounds like Asia is pretty much a safe bet for the next 10 years, 20 years. Yep. Foreseeable. Foreseeable future. Foreseeable. Because it's just on the doorstep of China. Yep. And that's just starting. All right. Well, that's, I think, one of the key messages. Any final questions from the audience? No? All right. Well, I think it's time for cocktails now. We're the last panel. Thank you very much, panel. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah.